Like I'm a curator in a museum. For <laughs> Christ's sakes. They're all on YouTube. They're brand new to people like you. It's like, yeah. hey, this is new stuff. I never saw this junk before. <laughs> um, and and um, there was a movie called Cabin on Hot Tin Roof where yeah. a singer, a folk singer named Burl Ives, he's the one that sang, uh, Oh my gosh, my golly, have a holly jolly Christmas. Well, he played this bastard in um, Cabin on Hot Tin Roof, and he was screaming. He says, "You want to live there like a dog? You want to lie and die like a dog?" <laughs> and and all of this stuff, all this energy, was what uh, John Piquet wanted to be put into this character. And so, um, and then yeah, there's two phases of Peter Lorre. There was the German expressionistic films like. I'd like a couple of hamburgers and make them raw. Yeah. And then there was the, I saw that eye, that blinking, that blinking. You know, yeah. And uh, it, it's a killer. I remember when I first did it, I called home and I said, I'm not going to be able to do this. I sounded like a uh, you know, like bald one or something. <laughs> I came to him screaming and yelling, honest to God. Well, then don't do it, yeah, but I have to do it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. cause it wasn't even the money, it was like, F this, you know? How can you get beaten by something like that? I refuse. Yeah. So you just overcome it, you find a way to do it. Um, but yeah, that was um, the composite of the Ren character. And so you're, you're, you're playing both of these characters. Um, I, I don't know, like, do you just go one into the next when you're doing a scene? Do you do each individually like that? We, we did that particular show, um, I ran through the script once as Stimpy, and then ran through the script as Ren, and then Prison Guard, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. whoever followed, yeah. <laughs> and, um, let's see, uh, and then there was a show called Doug. Yeah, but exactly what I'm doing this, come on. On Nickelodeon. I did it in real time. I had to do you it. went back and forth each voice in real time? Yeah, in real time. Oh my god. Yeah, and I wasn't suited for anything else. I told you about my childhood. <laughs> I really wasn't. That's a pretty good skill to have. When you want me as a babysitter, it's like, you know. But, uh, yeah, I found a new voice. Yeah, but the baby just walked out the front door. Yeah, but I found a new it's voice. A new voice, though. You'll be fine. <laughs> Not that drastic, but, but um, you know, they're 25 years older now, Doug and company. Yeah. So I was imagining, you know, Dear Jerome, today I blew up a courthouse. <laughs> Man, Doug got dark. <laughs> <laughs> My jail cell size in court, you know. The Honorable Judge Roger Klotz. Oh, like, no, no. Order, order, order in the court. Guilty, guilty. Oh, look who's in my courtroom. Funny, you loser. <laughs> I knew I was going to see you in here one day. Oh, yeah, funny. You're getting a thousand, no, five thousand years in jail. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then the beats play him off to jail or something. Like that. Right, but someday some animator's going to get his hands on a clip of this and, yes. and animate that yep, scene. Yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> I hope so. I can only hope. But that was, that, I, like, I grew up on that early 90s Nickelodeon, so, you know, it was, and back then there was only like four cartoons. It was like, you know, Doug and Rugrats, um, but the point, Ren and Stimpy. The point the being is that they never really grow up like you think they're going to grow up. Yeah. You know, it's like all the kids that were beating on me in high school, they all became cops. <laughs> 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 or dead, or in jail. That, but, that's, a, that's a sobering thought. <laughs> and, and then, like, some little mastermind, you know, when you grow up and use his powers for evil and figure out how to steal catalytic converters and, you know, yep. don't do it, don't. But I think I remember uh, reading and you said that Doug really was kind of like you when yeah. you were younger, right? Like, when I was 11, I did a lot of fantasizing. Yeah. Yeah, instead of Patty Mayonnaise, it was a girl named Karen on the sixth uh -huh. grade. And I just used to say her name over and over and say, oh. Karen. You know, you don't know anything. Yeah. You don't have, know anything about a woman or a girl or anything. You just, like, your heart is, uh, just wants to be near that energy, I guess, yeah. you know. And, and they always told you that a crush or a infatuation is not real. But it sure feels like it when you're going through it, yeah. you know. Nobody could convince me otherwise. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened to all those people, but they were there. They were part of life. 
Uh, Doug still definitely lives in my heart, and I'm sure the hearts of everyone who watched him growing up right there. Um, and you know something, I learned something new about you this week in doing my research, but uh, I had no idea, and maybe you guys don't either, but that you were the voice of, the, you still are the voice of the Red Eminem yes. in all the commercials. Dude, who knew that in here? Did people know that? Look at this, there's so many people who didn't know that. Have you ever eaten me? <laughs> I was on the Meredith Vieira show and they brought me out and they, they were trying to fool the audience and I was pretending to be like a truck driver. Sure. I said, yeah, you know, I, um, to get money for tolls, you know, sometimes I gotta go through my own seats and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, well, he's not a real truck driver. She goes, he's the voice of the red m, &M. and I look over and I go, have you ever eaten me? <laughs> she was mortified. She was mortified. The audience turned on me. For Christ's sakes, a candy? You know. It was like the face of no breaks. You should have seen her and Juliette Lewis. They were like... <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you do those commercials with a freaking Oscar winner, J.K. Simmons. That's right. How on, how on earth is that? I mean... Well, that was, the, that was the big joke. Like, um, I've been working with him for 30 years. Yeah. I've known the guy for 30 years, and I knew he was a national treasure when I first worked with him. I said, oh my God, this guy's going to be like major. And I just knew, you know, you could tell that some people have a light around them. And um, uh, my wife was a fan of the show Oz, the prison show. Yeah. And it was hardcore. And the, it was on HBO. And the worst guy in the prison was this white supremacist, uh, racist, psycho, you name it, murderer. And uh, I came home one time. This was when I was married. And I came home and she said, have you seen this show? What, this one, Oz? Yeah, look at this guy. Come here, look at this guy right here, this guy. This bastard, he ain't no actor, he's the real thing, he's the real deal. And I went, <laughs> and she, went she went, what? And I said, well, I know him. You <laughs> deal? Yeah, he's the yellow m, &M. <laughs> What was the reaction? Yeah. Oh, it was just like shock, dismay. Yeah, and then he became, you know, J.K. Simmons, you know, uh, uh, yeah, J.K. Jonah Jameson, yeah. you name it, yeah. And he's also uh, Farmer's... Farmer's Insurance, yeah. You know what, he's a journeyman. Two days later after he won an Oscar, he was in the studio working with me. Yeah. To me, that he has all my respect. He's not one of these divas, you know. Won the Oscar and said, okay, now what? Yeah. You know, what's the next job? Yeah. That's our worry to hear because, you know, I, I still think that is one of the best performances I've ever seen in a movie, his performance of Whiplash. Yes. Um, just one of the most terrifying performances, I think, in film history. And you're right, we see him as this, you know, journeyman actor everywhere, and just to know that he's just back in there. And then when you watch TV at night, it's like, the Notre Dame Cathedral Fire. Seen it? Covered it. Yeah. <laughs> This guy was just slapping Miles Teller for an hour and a half. <laughs> yes. Yes, but, but see, that's the beauty of what he does. He doesn't sit back and go, oh, everybody loves me. Yeah. You know, he's not one of those guys. Just keeps going. And, and even when he was being interviewed backstage at the Oscars, they were saying, you know, what's it like? You know, you finally won an Oscar. He says, it's okay, but I get to work with Billy West. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> As we all do. Yeah, he said that. Well, and I, I, I think everybody would be remiss if I didn't ask you about a little show called Futurama. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, you've heard of it. Good, 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 good. Um, this show took on such a life of its own. Of course, the, the great Matt Groening and, and all yes. of that. Like, how, I, I, I heard that you called uh, Fry like your 25 year old self, like your whiny 25 year old self. Is that right? Yeah, because I. First, the. Um, had me audition for other characters. Um, they, they, I think they already had somebody in mind for Fry, and they said, you want to try these? And they showed me pictures, and um, I just did what I thought was appropriate. And there was a lot of pressure, because you have all these brilliant people got together and developed yeah. something. Then they stick a picture in front of you and go, what would you do? <laughs> oh, no pressure. Yeah. So I thought long and hard before I opened my mouth. Um, you know, because I wanted them to last forever. I didn't want them to be like throwaways. Yeah. And I wanted them to be like, not cartoon characters, but people you could actually know. Sure. That could sit next to you, watching 
somebody like me on stage, you know, he reeks of phoniness. <laughs> I can spot a phony. I'm projecting, eh? <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, so anyway, those voices, you know, I started to do those, and then they wanted me to do Fry eventually, and I said, what should I do? I mean, I don't, you know, I wanted to do something that impressionists couldn't copy. Yeah. So you can't copy somebody's real voice. Yeah. It's, it's like, a, there's nothing there to grab onto. Yeah. Honest to God, I mean, you know, I sort of sound like Fry, just naturally. Yeah. But, but when I was 25, I was in a band, and I said, oh man, I broke a string. <laughs> now what am I gonna do? <laughs> Shit, an amp blew up. What the f you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was whiny, whiny, nasally, complaining, and, uh, and I was a project. All the girlfriends I had, you know, um, would buy guitar strings and beer because I never had any money. Uh -huh. <laughs> It'd be great if you could just buy me a six pack. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what it sounded like. And, um, and so uh, I wanted him to be a project because I was a project for every girl I ever went out with. was like, why are you going to dress like this? You look like a fruit peddler. <laughs> why don't you fix your hair? You know, I was a project. And I wanted to try to have that vibe, especially around Leela, where he was kind of like, in need yeah. of repair yeah. for a woman's touch, let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that would round him out, you know, dynamically, even though it wasn't being specified. It just adds another uh, vibe to a character. Shut up and take my autograph. Yeah. <laughs> That is like, you get, like, Fry has become like a second life in like meme and gift culture as well. Now, like, I, I think the take my money uh, meme is like one I use every single day. How did that happen? <laughs> if there was no internet, it wouldn't have happened. No. <laughs> but, uh... Well, and I, I do want to compliment you guys because the finale of Futurama is always universally seen as one of the best series finales of all time. Um, just the amazingly emotional way that they wrapped that up. Um, just what was that like doing those last few episodes? And did you get that feeling that it was going to be something that impactful um, um, on the fans? It's, it's always different from what I think it's going to be. Like um, the Jurassic Park episode, I knew it was going to be sad. I read it, oh, man. <laughs> and I performed it, and and I said, "This is going to be sad," but I didn't know how sad. And when I saw it on TV, I was like, ah! you, "You've all seen this, right? Like you've all you've all cried to this episode." I, was like, oh, I don't have a dog, but I have a cat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hugging the cat. Don't let her go anywhere on me now. <laughs> Never going out that door. <laughs> that episode broke me. Yeah, yeah so I just didn't. I didn't know how, and I didn't know how stupid some things were. Like, um, uh, somebody said, "Hey, Fry, I heard beer makes you stupid." He goes, "No, it doesn't." <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I looked at David come on the director. I said, "David, no, I'm doesn't." He goes, "Please read it as written." <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Come back for the nine hundred dollar fix it fee or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And then I see it on TV and I was like, ah! <laughs> and it was the best acting I ever did because I didn't know what I was saying, and Fry, as the character, didn't know what he was saying either. Yeah. So it's <laughs> so realistic. Uh, it was beautifully dumb. Absolutely. Well, I've got one more question. If you guys want to start lining up to ask him any of yes, the good news, everyone. Yeah. It's question time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm only, I'm only going to try to get you to break news one time, but of course, Futurama is coming back, yes? Yes. yes. For another 20 years. Futurama is coming back, everyone! Yeah, I agree. Can you tell us anything about it so far? Um, it's recorded in a room. Yes, there you go. And uh, there's microphones. Microphones, yes, to capture yeah. sound. And uh, now that we can come back to work, they're less cautious about distance. Yeah, yeah. Because of the pandemic. And, um, we're, we're, we've recorded about five new episodes so far, but, I yes. but there's no big revelations that I'm about to... No, of course not. We don't want that. No, because I'll get clobbered if I say <laughs> one thing. I'll get beat up in an alley. Matt will be waiting for me. Yeah, it's a criminal. Like blackjack. You never learn, do you? <laughs> You're like, there was a delay on the Futurama. <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> much. Big mouth. 
No, but what, it, what is it like just coming back together after it's that It's thrilling. You know, it's like, like we never left. Yeah. You know, it's Johnny DiMaggio, Maurice LaMarche, and Dave Herman, and Tress McNeil. Uh, we're not all piled into that room together like you would think. Yeah. We used to be. Yeah. In a semicircle. Mm -hmm. You know, so I could see Katie, and I could see John, and you know, you could work off each other. Katie is a real actor, you know. Yeah. She didn't, like, read and stare at the script. When she was talking to Fry, she would look at me. Oh, wow. And she'd already have... So she's never mind, mind. Yeah. Yeah. She would just look at me like that, and oh, I'd be wow. like, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart. <laughs> well, I think you are. <laughs> well, no, but she's, she's inspirational, and you ought to hear her sing. She invited oh, yeah. us one time. Katie had a band, and she said, you guys want to come and watch my band play? And I said, yeah. And I said, no, oh, that's cute. She got a little band. <laughs> we go down there, and she'd blow us away. She blew me away, and I was, I was, she did an original song, and it made me cry. Oh, wow. That's right. I'm all man, but I'm not afraid to admit that. There you go. I'm all hey, man. Hey, hey. I'm making this for him right while I'm sick of it. <laughs> I might go build a tool shed after this. <laughs> you know? Just all just with these chairs and build a shed or something. Yeah, don't get the wrong idea. <laughs> so so um, I cried and, and she said, what did you think? I said, Katie, that was beautiful. I said, you know, no offense, but you remind me of one of my heroes, Laura Nero, who was a songwriter and a singer. And she said she was my idol. Oh, really? Yeah, imagine that. that. Yeah. Well, that must have been an amazing compliment to her, you know? Oh, oh God, yeah. And she was professional all since, the, you know, forever. She was in that Midler's band, the Harlots. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Katie history right here. <laughs> well, aside from everything else, too, like your um, filmography and your work is just so immense. You've also done so many characters that other people started with that you picked up. Oh, yeah. And I can't even imagine the pressure that you must feel on, on stuff like that. Or, oh, or do you just go... And stuff? Yeah, or like, well, do you just go... You know, all the best work was done before we were born. That right. you gotta know going in. Yeah. And there was no no blank, you know, except no blank. Um, he could yeah. act. He wasn't just a collection of witty little voices, you know. He could act on everything. And that's why I really, really put a thousand percent into acting with a character. It can't be just recitation of the writer's words. Right? And, you know, when people said, yeah, you, you're really good acting with those characters. And I said, I really appreciate that because I work hard. It's, it doesn't just come, you know, off the tip of the tongue. I got to think about it and, um, and be conscientious. And, um, you know, you know um, gosh, was I going to say you were asking me? Uh... <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, like, the characters you've stepped into, uh, Bugs Bunny. Oh, that, yeah. Wood, Woody Woodpecker. Oh, I got uh, to link with Michael Jordan. Yeah! Jordan. Did you know he was Bugs Bunny in Space Jam, everyone? Did you know this? <laughs> Bugs Bunny in Space Jam. And I heard a very funny story about how you met Michael Jordan when that was happening, oh, right? Oh, I did, yeah. Um, he was, uh, there was a party on the Warner Brothers lot, and it was nighttime, and there was a big, huge crowd there, and there's Michael Jordan, bigger than life. He's got a huge crowd of people around him calling his name, Michael, 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 Michael. And, um, and so his sports agent, Ken Ross, goes, Michael, and he, he knows that voice, so he turned around. He said, this is Billy West, and he reached over like six, seven people <laughs> and shook my hand. <laughs> Honest to God. It was so cool. Yeah, well, I mean, like, what what was it like jumping into Bugs Bunny? I mean, because obviously that is one of the most iconic voices of all time. It was frightening because every other person that popped in the door said, he sounds too cute. <laughs> okay. And then somebody else would go, he sounds too Brooklyn. You got to cue him up. Okay. And then, you know, and then somebody else would come in and it's like, you know, he's not mean enough. And I was like, eh, shit it. <laughs> And there's a boy. Goodbye. Exactly. <laughs> well, you, uh, and, and do I remember right that you also do uh, Elmer Fudd in that movie yes. as well? Yeah, that was um, a tricky character. It was done by an actor named Arthur King Bryan. It was not Mel Blanc. And he was like, he was like a three-year-old, you know? He, he 
uh, he would put on that, that, that lazy R, Wesco, you know, wab it. And, um, and he would say, you know, shh, be fully, fully quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> no, like a brain dead hunter. Nothing funnier. Nothing funnier. And then, and then he would go from zero to sixty. Oh, my God! Well, bless you, wabbit. You know, oh no, I've killed the little bunny wabbit. You know, yeah, like, all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> all over the place. And there was so many dynamics going on in there. It was, it was hysterical. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you also. Um, did Chatty in Scooby Doo after yeah. Casey Kasem, right? Oh yeah. Like, I, I, like I, I, that voice is just so ingrained in people's brains when they hear it. Like, how on earth? Because I, I know you want to try, wanted to try to put your own spin on it as well, right? Sure. But, um, but I, I knew Kate. I met him. You know, I mean, okay. and I've worked on an episode of uh, Scooby Doo with him. I played his cousin. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Shaggy's cousin. So it was a natural fit. Right? Yeah, I guess, but um, but the thing, the reason why he wasn't doing Shaggy, this was for Zombie Island. I don't know if you saw that, but I thought that was the, the best one only because of the soundtrack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was a killer soundtrack. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, I, I was like, uh, you know, watching him and he, and he was a vegan, adamant, militant. And I'm a vegan too, but I don't care what other people eat. I'm not a, 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 a you know, fascist. I don't care. You know, enjoy whatever it is you enjoy eating. Please enjoy it. I enjoy watching somebody. But for me, it's not, you know, I've been a vegan for thirty something years. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so he was like, you know, come on, Scoop. We gotta get some hot dogs in. Why does it always have to be meat? <laughs> and he got upset. Yeah. Dude, you know, I mean, he should know better than anybody that it's a piece of paper, a clear plastic piece of paper, and another one after that, and another one after that, and they film it. Yeah. You know, it's not real. But he was like, you know, he wanted to, to say, well, I'm not going to promote me. Really? Yeah. So then eventually it just became snacks. Scooby snacks. Yeah. Great world, school. we got to get some snacks. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, yeah, that's why that came about. That's why it was. That's why I'm just I was doing it. Yeah, that's I mean, insane. but but there were snacks before I did it. But yeah. he, but it's a true story. He didn't want to do it because because they ate meat. <laughs> the way things come into existence. Hey, he doesn't eat dead animals. And I said, you know, he's gonna be one someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I seem so callous and heartless. Well, you know, uh, something that we were sort of uh, talking about in the back before we came out here was, um, you know, animation today, it seems like they always want to get big time movie star actors as opposed to using the voice actors yeah. um, anymore. And I just thought to myself while you were saying that, like, what if there is someone out there, just like you said, what if there is this um, young lady out there that can do so many different voices and immensely talented, but won't ever get the chance to do that? Well, as somebody who's been through this industry, what would you say to someone who wants to do that? Well, first of all, I always say, we're saving a seat for you. Yeah. Really, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I admire artists and artisans and craftspeople. If you're doing voices, don't be, don't bring who and what you are to every goddamn character. Yeah. You know, because where's the art? Where's the alchemy? There's no change. They used to hire people like us to come in, you know, and, they, and they, these producers would say, listen, we've got this bar of lead on the table, and we wondered if you could just change it into gold before you left. Okay. <laughs> and no problem. Now the actors come in and walk right by the lead bar and go, where's my $10 million? Because there's no, there has to be alchemy. Something yeah. has to transform into something else, otherwise it has no magic. Yeah. That's what I believe. Yeah. No, so that's just my opinion, but, um, you know, we were, we were halfway backstage, back there, and we're watching the screen from the side, and they're rolling credits to some new stupid cartoon. <laughs> and I said, three, two, one. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, yeah. Three, two, one. Ryan Reynolds. Three, two, one. The Rock. 
you know, you can't make, there's an ordinance in L.A. You cannot make a movie. <laughs> you can't make a movie without, without Kevin Hart. Without Kevin Hart. <laughs> you can't make a commercial. Well, there's an ordinance. Yeah, yeah. And they'll string you up <laughs> if you don't use it. <laughs> yeah. I should just, you know, I'd love to cut off one of his feet and carry it as a lucky charm. There you go. Like a rabbit foot, you know. I think we found the headline for Billy West's film. <laughs> Kevin Hart just standing out there. But that is, there is, a real, there is a real craft to voice acting that is there, and, and I think that that is something that I hope we don't get lost. Yeah. Um, I always hope that too, but it doesn't look like it's going to go that way. But don't let that deter you. If there's anybody in this audience that's thinking of, of wanting to do acting or voice acting, um, yes, it is acting. It's real acting. It's yeah, not it's... a redheaded bastard stepchild of show business. It's not. Um, I know actors. I know voice actors that can piece circles around stage actors. Yeah. <laughs> For real. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and, and J.K. doing the yellow M and M. No one would ever know that was him. No. <laughs> you know. So um, that's my point. Um, there's really, really great people, and you know. They don't, they're getting recognition nowadays because of the internet. Like, yeah. People, you know, I, nobody knew me when I first started out and they said, you did what? And, and I hadn't really done anything and there was no internet. So you had to meet people one at a time and, and say, oh, well, here's what I do. But now it's out there. So people do know names. You know the name Robbie Paulson. You know yeah. the name Maurice yeah. Marsh. You know, you know uh -huh. Jimmy Cummings, Tom <laughs> Kenny, yeah. all my pals. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think we got an uh, um, audience question here, so say your name and uh, what do you like to know? Yeah, my name is Mertz. Hi. And I'm just curious, um, I never thought Ren and Snippy really got the credit for kind of paving the way uh, for some animation that followed it, even up today. What is your opinion on where Ren and Snippy stands in the history and its place in animation? Well, I know there's a pattern there. It's like when something serendipitously hits, it's only because they let the artists do their thing. The oversight was mild compared to what it usually is, is they want to control every thought, every idea, every everything. And they don't let artists be artists for the most part. But when they do, boom, you'll have like a Ren and Stimpy. And, um, and then everything after that, there's, there's like this, this axiom in Hollywood, everybody wants to be the first one to be second to do something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's a place where, where the crowd of people is chasing after where lightning just struck. <laughs> you know, chasing the trends and all that. But yeah, there was a lot of imitations afterwards. And every, every uh, commercial that I watched had the font, the, the writing from Ren and Stimpy, the, the um, whatever you call the font. Yeah, the font. Yeah. You know, and um, so yeah, it was really impactful. I think it did get originally got the accolades for being groundbreaking. I remember reading a lot of good stuff about it. Definitely. Thank you for that yeah, question. Thanks for the question. Uh, over here. Hi. Hi. Um, first off, giant fan. Uh, Thank you. Super happy to see you today. So, what I was thinking about, you talked about the Futurama revival a little bit. Yes. Now, I think you might remember about a week after, there was a huge controversy started uh, known as Bender P. In which people found out that John DiMaggio would be returning to play Bender, or as it was originally called, it was uh, eventually vetoed, and uh, he is currently returning. Did you hear about that initially, and were you like, "My God, what are you doing?" It's about resigning and all that. Yeah, were you like, well, I um, people asked me about it, and I said, "I knew he was going to come back. He was just looking for the right pen." <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Goes on in that world. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Over here. Appreciate it. I'm Cassie, and I was just wondering if a fan's voice or personality ever helped you uh, make a new character voice. Wow, that's a good question. Sometimes the unspoken voices, like somebody's reply on the internet, um, will inspire me to act or, or come up with a sound. I'm, 
I'm really weird like that. I, I made a joke, and you can't, apparently, there's another ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> you can't make jokes anymore. You have somebody hunt you down. You know, and I swear there's apps, like, on certain people's computers, so if the word retard comes up, or deaf, or blind, you know, it buzzes, and they go right to where it was said. And they're 20, and they have no life experience, and they want to scold you. You know, I'm sorry, but, but, so I make this joke about Rush Limbaugh, who was vile. He made fun of everybody. He was merciless, and then he, and, and I said, a lot of people don't know that he invented high deaf radio. He was both high and deaf. <laughs> so all of a sudden, BLM, the social justice, da, 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 da. and, and um, I used to like you, and now I, I don't like you because you make fun of deaf people. <laughs> I wasn't making fun of, I was making fun of Rush Limbaugh. She would never, not hear of it, not hear, I don't even know why I'm explaining myself to somebody with no life experience. Um, it's just, they're just reactionaries, you know, and it's so easy to just, you know, be in some corner somewhere and point your finger and accuse somebody of something and then watching glee as they try to explain that that's not how it is. But that person doesn't have to answer to anything, no accountability. But that's okay, that's okay. You know, I was young and I used to get in everybody's face. But, um, but the thing about it is that that, that voice, that, that response triggered my imagination of what that person must be saying in their head, you know. Um, and, and then I knew how it was going to end how these conversations usually end. I'm trying to understand why they don't get it, and it's like, I can't convince you. And then some guy chimes in, and he insults her, and I said, three, two, one, here comes the profanity. Just her profanity laced, and then took off, you know? So, but, but that's that, you know, there's, there's no greater fascist than, the newly empowered. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yes. All right, I think we got time for the fascist. You, know, like, you don't have the right to say that, but I have the right to say what I want to say to you. Okay. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Oh, uh, no, why? Are you in that much of a hurry? I don't know, man. Are you that busy? <laughs> Please. Oh, I'm in and off? Okay. Hi. Hi. So, I guess my question would be, uh, uh, well, out of all the, like, the voice acting that you've done, what is your like, absolute favorite moment of like, what you've done? Favorite moment? That's yes. a good one. It's a tough one, though. Um, you know what, I, I liked, if you ask me like some of my favorite episodes of Futurama, one of them is the, the um, Devil's Hands episode. And I liked it more than most of them, only because Ken Keeler wrote an operetta. And we were singing, yeah. and Fry was singing, and I thought, he, he sounds heartfelt. I try to make him sound heartfelt, not clownish or goofy where you could make fun of it, he said, he's really hurt, you know, destiny cheating him, and it was very Shakespearean or Greek tragedy. And uh, I think that was a high point for me, learning one of Ken Keeler's melodies. That's a tough thing to do. And then, of course, Katie comes in and mops the floor with the song. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, folks, we've got Thank another you very to get today.